Hello, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and I have another example here today coming out of Engineering Mechanics Dynamics, and this comes out of the chapter focused on rigid body motion, and the subtopic is fixed axes rotation. So not general plane motion yet, just things moving around fixed axes. So what we have here in this scenario is we have an assembly that's essentially designed to lift up this load. Okay, so um, we have a motor. This motor is rotating about its center at six inches in radius. And as it turns, it turns a gear. Now the gear is attached to the side of a large cable spool. So the cable is coming off this side, dropping down, and then attached to this load. So if the load started down here at the ground at rest and then started being pulled on by this system, moved up four feet with a constant acceleration that entire distance, and ended up here at three feet per second, we're going to use that as our starting conditions to solve for three different things. One is going to be the acceleration vector of point C. And so point C is basically just a, a representative point out here on the um, on the circumference of that spool. The next thing we'll solve for is the angular velocity and angular acceleration of the motor. Okay, so we're going to have to transfer basically through this gear assembly to end up here at the motor. And then finally we'll solve for the angular displacement, the theta, um, of the motor as well. You can think that's like the number of revolutions, the number of, we're actually solving in radians, but the number of radians that it has to turn in order to raise this load that distance of four feet. So let's go ahead and get started. So taking a look at the first term here, we want to find the acceleration vector for point C. And as we think about acceleration vector, um, if we know that at point D, we have an acceleration coming up this way, this would be my tangential acceleration. We'd also have a normal acceleration going toward the middle of that wheel. And what we'd find is that we'd have exactly the same acceleration at point C. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch these on here. So this would be my A sub T, and this would be my A sub N. Now we're going to have the same acceleration once again anywhere around the circumference as long as we focus on tangent normal coordinates. And of course, we're going to not only have the same acceleration, but also the same velocity. So this velocity here at D um, is basically um, the, the wheel or this point on the, the spool is moving up at the same three feet per second as, um, as the load is as well. So in order to translate that load motion over into our assembly, we're actually going to reach back to particle motion and we had a 1D particle motion equation that related our tangential acceleration, our instantaneous velocity, and also the distance over which that velocity was created. And that equation is the following. We have our final velocity squared minus our initial velocity squared, uh, both of those divided by two, and this is going to be equal to our acceleration. Now I'm going to write this as a sub t because this is the time rate of change of the magnitude of the velocity, not the direction of the velocity. So a sub t times the distance over which the velocity was generated. So you see this is s minus s naught. And so there is our overall equation. Now we can go through and get rid of a few terms. We know we started at rest. We also can assume that the ground was at zero height. And so getting rid of two of those terms Plugging in the numbers we know for the rest, we know we have a three foot per second. You can divide that by two. The a sub t is still unknown, and this is happening over four feet. And so from this, we can solve that a sub t is equal to a value of 1.125. This is going to be in feet per second squared. Feet per second squared because we have our velocity in feet per second and we also have our distance in feet, right? So we have to make sure that all of our units line up. Now we will have some numbers coming in here, some distances in inches, and I'm gonna end up converting those to feet as well, kind of a preview going forward. So we found the magnitude here of a sub t. We also need our normal acceleration, right? Because point C is moving in a curve. And the simplest form of the normal acceleration we could use is that a sub n is equal to v squared over rho. 
right? We don't yet know our omega, otherwise we could use our omega squared times our rho or our radius. Um, but we'll go ahead and use this one. So V squared is three squared divided by the radius of curvature out to the edge, right? It's not just 18 inches, but it's 24 inches. And then we're gonna divide that by 12 to convert that into feet. And so we end up being a normal acceleration here of 4.5 feet per second squared. So we have our tangential, we have our normal, we could bring those together. And so uh, let me just label these here, part A, part B, and part C. Part C. And so we have the answer to part A is that the acceleration of point C as a vector in tangent normal coordinates is equal to 1.125, I'll put it in bracket notation here, comma, 4.5 in the normal. Now both of those are positive. They're positive because tangential is defined, uh, the tangential axes in the direction of motion and the normal axes toward the center of curvature. And so both of those are going to be positive terms and have units of feet per second squared. Okay, so that would be our first answer for part A. So next up for part B, we need to find our omega and our alpha of this motor. And so in order to do that, we need to find the omega and the alpha of the gear and spool assembly and then transfer that over to motor A using our fixed axis rotation, our no slip wheels or meshing gears um, equation. So let's go ahead and work through those steps. So now we're on to part B and we want to first find our omega B and alpha of B. So let's take a look at that. We have that. Our Now the fundamental equation we're gonna use here is a couple of them. One of them is V equals omega times R. So let's go ahead and start with this one. And we rearrange this really because we're, we're solving for here is the omega. We know the V, we know the R. So rearranging this equation, we find that omega is equal to V over R. Now note that this equation comes from our original vector equation, V is equal to omega cross R. Now, as long as the velocity and the radius are perpendicular, then we can basically break it down into the scalar form. Also, there's no um, opposite vector mathematical tool to basically undo this cross product, right? Like a, a addition is the opposite of subtraction and multiplication is the opposite of division. We don't have an opposite of cross products. And so if we're gonna solve for the omega, we need to turn it into a scalar form. And then we're gonna take our sign on that omega from um, the observation of the motion as opposed to any kind of a vector solution. Okay, so that's our general equation there. We're gonna do that um, here first for the omega. So we can put that omega of B is equal to the velocity at the edge there was three and the distance back to the center once again is 24 inches divided by 12. So not the radius of the gear, but the radius of the spool. And so omega of B works out to be 1.5 radians per second. And then we have a very similar equation for our tangential acceleration, right? That A sub T is equal to alpha times R. We can rearrange this and find that alpha is equal to our A sub T divided by our R. Putting the values in here, we find out that alpha of B, which is also the alpha of the spool, is equal to our known value of 1.125. We found that in part A. And we're gonna divide that once again by 24 divided by 12. which gives us a value of 0 0.562 in radians per second. Let's go ahead and draw those real quick up here on the drawing. So we know that if our velocity is going upwards here, then our omega has to be going there in a positive right-hand rule direction. And then we also know that our alpha has to match that same direction because it needs to match up with this a sub t. Okay, so both of those basically would end up, if we want to add that on here just out of observation, they're both going to be in the positive k hat direction where as we wrap our fingers around, put our fingertips 
toward the arrowhead, our thumb will come perpendicular out of the page. And so we'll end up with that positive k hat, so a positive k hat direction. Now, just out of observation here, we could also then see that our omega and our alpha of the motor need to be in the opposite direction. Okay, so here would be our omega of A, and then additionally our alpha of A. I haven't found those values yet, but just by observation, we know that the common point right here has the same velocity. It also has the same tangential acceleration. Now, it turns out that these values are actually going to be the same as um, anywhere else around the outside of the gear. So not the 3 feet per second of the 1.125, um, but the same values, like I said, across or around this entire gear face at this radius here of 18 inches. Okay, so let's go ahead and transfer those over. I'll do that spatially kind of right here. And so we're basically bringing this value here over and this value here over. We're gonna use the same equations, right? Because we um, are, we're gonna use equations that are, that are based upon these same relationships, right? So if we share a velocity, we can actually say that our velocity, um, let me just call this point P, okay? So our velocity of A at point P is equal to our velocity of B at point P. If I know that that's true and I bring in this equation here, I can say that my omega of A times my R of A is equal to my omega of B times my R of B, right? R of A, R of B being the radiuses. And so what we need to solve for here is we need to solve for omega of A so we can rearrange here just a touch and say omega of A is equal to omega of B times R of B divided by my R of A. Plugging in the numbers, we have, let's bring this over this direction. So um, my omega of A equal to, so my omega of B, 1.5 radians per second. My radius of B is known to be, so that's that 18 inches, and we're going to divide that by 24, excuse me, 18 divided by 12, excuse me. So uh, 18 inches divided by 12 inches per foot. So basically the inches will cancel out and the foot will carry up and we'll end up with a velocity out of this term. And then we're going to divide this by the radius of A and the radius of A, I'll go ahead and put that in feet just to start with 0 0.5 feet. So once again, the canceling here is that inches um, cancels with inches. The feet ends up coming to the top. When it gets to the top, it's going to cancel with this feet and we're left with radians per second. It's always nice to be able to check your units and see if those line up. So we have omega of A equal to 4.5 radians per second and just by observation, we know that's in the negative k hat because it's going the opposite direction of our omega of b. And very similar relationship that alpha of a times r of a is equal to alpha of b times r of b. Once again, that's functionally because this a sub t is constant, is equal at point p. And so we can um, take a sub t on both bodies and turn that over into the a sub t is equal to alpha times r. So now solving for alpha of a, our angular acceleration of the motor, alpha a is equal to alpha b times r b divided by our r of a, right, our radius of body a. So plugging in these numbers, we find that alpha of A is equal to our 0 0.562. Once again, my radius here, and I'm going to put this radius in terms of feet just for simplification, 1.5 feet, that's the 18 divided by 12, and I'm going to divide that by 0 0.5 feet, the radius of A, and we end up with a value of uh, 1.688 radians per second, and once again, it's in the negative k-hat. By observation, right, again, looking at this purple vector right here, wrapping my fingers around toward my fingertips toward the arrowhead, um, and we have our thumb going into the page that gives us that negative k-hat. All right, so that is 
the answer to part B, basically this one here and this one here. And so the only thing that we have left in this problem is to figure out the amount of rotation, our theta sub A. Okay, so there's a couple ways we could work through this one. Um, we could find our theta sub b and then transfer it over here to the motor, but don't we actually know now our omega of b and our alpha, excuse me, our omega of a and our alpha of a, our angular velocity and angular acceleration of this motor? And if we think about our purely angular equations, we're actually going to pick an equation that looks a lot like this one, except for it's going to only have angular terms and not linear terms. Okay, so an equation out of rigid body motion versus out of particle motion. And so for part C, figuring out our theta sub A, we have an equation that says our angular velocity final squared divided by 2 minus our angular velocity squared initial divided by 2 is equal to our alpha of that same body as long as that alpha is constant right this equation only is valid if this is constant otherwise we'd have to take an integral basically to get to the same relationship or a similar relationship and then this is going to be times our theta minus theta naught all right, so a little bit of logic we have to think through here. The first is that if the load starts at rest, then doesn't the wheel start at rest as well, right? These are in constrained motion. And so we'd have an initial angular velocity of zero. And then additionally, if we go ahead and call the initial angular position zero as well, now we can take a look and we can plug in, once again, this is for just A. Uh, I already that, have that one, and that would be for A as well. So putting these values in, we have um, 4.5. Now, I do want to bring over this negative value here, right? Because this is a directional equation. Now, for the omega, I'm going to end up squaring that, and the negative will go away. But it turns out it won't go away for alpha sub A, right? So bringing in alpha sub A of negative 1.6. 8, 8, and that's going to be times theta sub a, the angular distance um, over which um, this thing moves, this motor moves, we find that theta sub a is equal to 6 radians. It's a negative 6 radians so negative six fundamentally meaning that it is moving opposite the right-hand rule. We'll note here that this negative means opposite a positive right-hand rule. And of course, opposite a positive right-hand rule is the same thing as clockwise. Where positive from the right-hand rule is counterclockwise. All right, and so that is the last thing to solve for on this example. Hope it was helpful. We took a look at multiple things here, just kind of in a quick review. We first had to, of course, understand what the problem asked and what's going on kind of physically. We then, in part A, got into some linear functions, at least to start with, in translating the motion from the load over to the composite body. Once we completed that, we were able to then find the normal acceleration using actually also an equation we used all the way back in particle motion, our v squared over rho. Um, that gave us the second component we needed for the acceleration here at point C. We then used that velocity and tangential acceleration to then translate from linear back to angular. So here's the angular values, omega sub b, so angular velocity of b and angular acceleration of b. We then use our fixed axis rotation. Now note that these equations, this equation here and the similar one for alpha, are only valid if both of these bodies are rotating about their centers. Okay, They're not valid for anything in general plane motion. They're not valid for wheels rolling down a road, which are in general plane motion. Um, only if things rotate about their center. So let me pull a note here. So only if rotating about center.
sorry for the disappearing ink there, but I'm not going to rewrite that. So we use that those equations to transfer over our um, angular velocity, angular acceleration. We then use that angular velocity and acceleration into just our rotational relationship, right? This doesn't have any time associated with it. Uh, the base form of this equation that it came from is omega d omega is equal to alpha d theta. So essentially by taking a derivative of both sides of this, excuse me, an integral of both sides of this equation and putting on our limits, um, we ended up with this constant um, acceleration relationship solved for our negative six radians. So the rotation of the motor was nearly one revolution, right, with um, two pi radians per revolution. Well, I hope that that helps you understand fixed axis rotation, and I wish you all the best.